Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon um, for another webinar by CCAST, uh, the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategies Toolbox. My name is Ariel Leger, and I am CCAST Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator based out of the University of Arizona in Tucson. For those of you who are CCAST, and I see quite a few names I'm unfamiliar with, which is great. I love to see CCAST grow. Um, what CCAST does is support issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through webinars like this one, case studies, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice, like the Grassland Community of Practice that this webinar is hosted to support, and other communities of practice, like the non-native aquatic control community of practice that Christy facilitates, and what about Jordan? Today, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Carlos Gonzalez and Cody McIntyre about mesquite control for grassland restoration at Elephant Mountain Wildlife Management Area. Carlos Gonzalez is the now endowed professor of habitat um, research and management at the Borderlands Research Institute. He's an assistant professor in the natural resource management departure at Sol Ross University. Dr. Gonzalez's research has focused on white-tailed deer and habitat interactions, bighorn sheep restoration in Texas, ecological monitoring of military lands in the Chihuahuan Desert. He has a broad interest in population dynamics modeling, spatial landscape ecology, and rangeland ecology and management. Cody McIntyre is, in, is the area manager at Elephant Mountain Wildlife Management Area. He has over 10 years of department service and his responsibilities have revolved around desert bighorn sheep restoration in Texas. Since taking over at Elephant Mountain Wildlife Management Area, he's focused on reducing brush encroachment and stabilizing watersheds on the 23,105 acre management area. Just as a final reminder, um, this presentation will be followed by a Q&A session and discussion. Uh, so please, as we go along, write any questions you have into that chat um, that you can find at the bottom of your screen there, the little chat box, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during that discussion. Um, and with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dr. Gonzalez and Cody. Everybody see my screen? Yeah, it looks great. All right. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. We're certainly excited to be here uh, presenting what we've done in West Texas. Uh, it's been several years now trying to figure out how to improve habitat, and we're still working on it. Uh, but we do seem to have some preliminary results now showing some positive results for at least grassland birds on, on our side. Uh, before we start the presentation, I do want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, our grad student, Emily Card is really the person that should probably be giving the presentation, at least for my side of things. Uh, she has been a rock star uh, of our team leading the, the grassland bird restoration monitoring program. Uh, so a lot of what I'll present is preliminary work uh, or results from her work of monitoring uh, out here in West Texas. Uh, first, I wanted to start out uh, talking a little bit about the vegetation changes in Texas rangelands. Uh, the only constant in life uh, is change. So we see change throughout time and we see that habitat and the, the plant community is never actually stable. Uh, we, we have a lot of concern sometimes with people wanting to do conservation and in their minds that implies no change uh, in the plant community. Otherwise we need, we need to have that plant community be stable, uh, but it doesn't necessarily fit our goals. So we need to be comfortable with the idea of change uh, and especially when we're trying to do some restoration. Some of the causes for, for change have been natural, uh, drought, fires, lack of fires specifically, sometimes overgrazing. So there, there's natural and human caused um, for, for those changes, but it's been ongoing for thousands of years. Uh, but one thing that we, we know that changes the landscape, for example, for that picture is the King Ranch brand and South Texas. So they actually used a uh, mechanical treatment and then with a tractor and a GPS, so they can actually put their logo on the landscape. So humans can have a great impact. 
So within those impacts that we see various ecosystem services are actually being negatively impacted by this brush encroachment of problems that we're having. Some of those problems are biodiversity. We're seeing less biodiversity. We're seeing some loss of, of habitat and that's being translated to loss of populations of grassland birds specifically. Uh, another species of concern in West Texas is pronghorn. Uh, they pronghorn rely uh, on open grassland areas and we're having issues with brush encroached areas through the restoration program. So we're trying to, to expand uh, the habitat that they actually have right now. Ground, groundwater recharge uh, for people is, is a big problem. And in Texas being privately owned, uh, over 95% of it being privately owned, there's a lot of people that depend on land productivity. So as we see this increase in brush species, uh, we see a whole lot less uh, productivity for livestock and wildlife uh, and other um, ecosystem services. One of the greatest or some of the issues that we have is we always want students, especially in classes, when I talk to them, we want to see that everything mimics what seems to be on the left side of the screen on that picture, just open grasslands um, that may have been there 100 years ago. But what is it presently and what influences are there uh, in the landscapes? So in other words, if we actually go and do some kind of improvement in this habitat, are we taking away those influences that are shifting the plant community uh, that would shift the plant community back to what it was before the treatments. So just the things to think about as we go through this process of what we've done uh, and showing some advantages and disadvantages to the use of herbicides specifically is that it's not a magical solution. We don't just apply a herbicide and then these grassland, this brushland transforms into a grassland and then stays as a grassland forever. An important thing to to think about that I think we don't ask ourselves, we lose that in the curiosity that we have as children of what we're asking why, why, why. Uh, I think we lose that as adults and it's very important to be asking ourselves why we even need to be doing any type of improvements before we, we start any of the projects. It's been my experience uh, that at least the first two tend to be the main um, reasons we try to do any kind of improvements. We want to increase quantity and quality of forage, or that is for wildlife or livestock production. Uh, and that really ties into everything else. Once we increase the amount of forage, the amount of grass cover, we tend to increase the amount of wildlife available, livestock production, fire hazards, um, water harvest, erosion control. There's just this, this great list of reasons why we should do it, uh, why we should try to improve the habitat and to control for some of this brush encroachment uh, but again, it's still important to actually to decide why we want to do those things. Uh, this is just um, one of the, the images showing uh, where the grasslands are uh, within North America. Uh, for us in Texas, we are down here where the red is. Um, but one of the greatest things of concern is that I wanted to share is there's some of the grasslands, uh, for example, that we've lost up to 98% uh, of that land. Uh, we're, we're really losing a whole lot of grassland very rapidly, uh, way faster than we are recovering from brush encroachment. That's one of the main concerns. So what options do we have? Uh, we can see native uh, plants. We can do some prescribed burning. We can do some grazing through livestock, mechanical, biological. Uh, but it, for today specifically, we're gonna be talking uh, about our experience using chemical uh, applications or management techniques. There's multiple ways of applying herbicide. Uh, you can use it from a UTV, an ATV, from a backpack sprayer. Uh, and our, our experience, because we're using it for very large amounts of land uh, at one time, really what we're focusing is aerial applications. So we either use helicopters or fixed wing uh, airplane uh, to do this application that gives us that advantage of being a very quick application, meaning that we can apply everything that we need to within a couple of days and then be done with that. 
Okay, so talking to uh, Ariel, it seems like y'all have seen this case study before. It was a 2015 application of Sendero to Honey Mesquite. It happened at Elephant Mountain WMA. Um, I'm going to go through just kind of a brief overview of what that looked like, um, what, what we saw from that. And I'm going to go ahead and give a little bit more information on what that land looks like now, what um, other treatments um, we've applied to that land, and kind of what our goals are. Um, so if uh, you've been out to this area, you know Elephant Mountain sits just south of Alpine. It's about 23,000 acres, and it's in a transition zone between the Ch Chihuahuan Desert Scrub and desert, uh, high desert grasslands. As you can see there, we uh, include a lot of different ecological sites throughout this uh, 23,000 acres. So in 2015, we applied Sendero. Uh, we had two um, application methods. It was uh, aerial application and IPT, um, individual plant treatments. And uh, we also had two herbicide uh, methods. So we had straight Sendero, and then we had Sendero mixed with a uh, Remedy Ultra. And um, so these were all applied in the same time frame um, between July and August, about mid-August of uh, 2015. Here's just a map kind of detailing um, the sizes of each of those plots, um, where controls set and where the uh, different applications set. Um, if you notice, there is a riparian zone running right through the middle, that's Calamity Creek. Um, it runs the ent entire length of um, the western edge of Elephant Mountain. So in year one, we saw a major canopy reduction. Um, they defoliated within about a week of application and um, it was looking really promising. There were a lot of plots taken out there where we're monitoring for uh, vegetative changes as well as wildlife use, um, specifically scaled quail. What we did notice throughout this study is that there may have been a bit of a negative effect on forbs um, from the application. And one of those um, active ingredients from Remedy is known to be a uh, broadleaf um, forb suppressant. So that may have had something to do with the amount of usage that um, we saw with scale quail in that area. So after a year, this was the estimated mortality rates. Um, in this year, we didn't see a whole lot of rainfall. So the flagging um, and the re-sprouting was not as noticeable as it was a couple years post-treatment. And uh, so we'll kind of talk about um, what we saw um, coming up, I guess, was a whole lot of these structures that looked like they were dead were um, starting to re-sprout. We we're getting pretty dense canopies that were about um, three to five feet um, in width that were coming up as well as additional flagging and some of the smaller stuff. So with this soil type, um, spike was a really good option to help us with the creosote, tar bush, and some of the acacia species that were really dense. And this was kind of our um, time that we wanted to wait and let that Sendero keep working. Um, I think it's recommended to have about four to seven years between applications of Sendero. So we hit it with spike in 2018. Um, I've got a picture of what that looked like prior to spike. So that's a lot of that, that uh, standing skeleton, which, you know, it, it shows that we were able to defoliate this. However, there's still a lot of structure out there and that's still very um, impeding for, for sight, for, for pronghorn, and then a lot of the grassland birds that rely on a quick uh, flight and escape that, that's really not very conducive to their habitat. So it was something that we are still considering, uh, maybe doing some mechanical treatment, uh, possibly burns if we do end up with a fuel load that would allow for that. Um, but currently that's, that's uh, what it looks like. So let me just get back over to the spike here. So on our spike application in 2018, um, we did it at about a pound of active ingredient per acre. We treated 571 acres. And you can see the cost there was right at uh, $26,000. So prior to the spike treatment, we we're seeing about a 50% um, woody cover mix. And then um, the ground cover was well under 50%. We were seeing a lot of bare dirt, a lot of pedestaling throughout the area. 
from erosion um, and there's very low water infiltration, a lot of gravelly um, soils once you start getting closer to the mountain. Um, high runoff obviously goes with all of that. But post-treatment, we saw um, a significant decrease in the amount of woody cover. Uh, we were down probably below 15%. Um, like I said, that soil type, that straddlebug soil type is, is really conducive to a spike and uh, turned out really good. We did see a very high forb shock. So once again, we weren't seeing a lot of quail usage in there because of um, the lack of food really. Um, and then two years post-treatment, we got some pretty good rains and we started seeing a lot of herbaceous cover come back. A lot of those, um, you know, uh, uh, restoration grasses coming up, those early successional um, forbs coming up. And uh, so that, that was looking good and it was really starting to hold a lot of that soil together. Then um, four years, or I guess five years post-treatment um, from that initial Sendero application, we applied straight Sendero again. This time we did it, um, it in all uh, aerial and we treated about 568 acres for about $22,000. So pre-treatment, we were seeing a lot of re-sprout. Estimated, especially near the creek, was about 40% re-sprout and canopies um, were looking anywhere from three to eight feet, depending on how far off of that watershed that they were. Um, there were a lot of native early successional species that were establishing at the plant bases, but they were starting to decrease over time with the increase of that canopy cover. So post-treatment, um, we saw a, a pretty good response. I think the initial treatment, there was such thick canopy and this canopy was sitting um, up to six feet over the ground that a lot of that spray was not getting to the lower um, plants and the lower parts of, of uh, these bigger structures of mesquite. So we saw a big knockback in those areas, um, a definite reduction in flagging. And then uh, we've seen a, a huge increase in herbaceous growth last year. We had a great year with about 16 inches of rain, which is almost two inches more than our average. And so um, this year we have not had that and we're seeing um, a, a pretty good uh, maintenance in that area, not much erosion, but definitely not a lot of um, additional uh, grasses or forbs coming on. All right, we're gonna shift now uh, a little bit into another example where we've treated for mesquite. Uh, specifically now, this is Emily Card's uh, thesis work. She's looking into the response of grassland bird obligates um, in areas where we treated for, for honey mesquite. Uh, basically this slide, uh, what's indicating is we have seen some reduction in populations of birds, uh, but specifically those in grassland seem to be the ones uh, that are currently hurting the most or those populations are decreasing the most. Uh, we do see that uh, there's a, a shift within these grasslands of uh, a decrease in the amount of cover in the soil through, through grass and there's an increase of shrubs and specifically within some of the central uh, Great Plains, we see a lot of that change, but that holds to be true throughout uh, many parts of the Chihuahua Desert. Uh, woody plant encroachment, uh, again, it's basically that the, the shift between uh, grass dominated uh, to woody plant uh, dominated uh, plant communities. Uh, specifically, uh, we're looking into the winter grassland birds. Uh, we see that they spend their winter here, uh, which is the area in blue. Uh, you see the transpecos, uh, it's in the heart uh, of where they like to, to spend the winter. Uh, and then the breeding season where we don't monitor, they move back up north. So everything that we're gonna be speaking for, for Emily's work is actually within uh, the, the winter uh, season of these birds. Uh, specifically, uh, one of our objectives is to evaluate the wintering bird community response to woody plant removal efforts uh, in herbicide treated plots. Uh, we specifically monitored these birds. Uh, grassland bird species uh, will be, so what we expected to see was the grassland bird species will be more abundant in herbicide treated plots after the chemical application has been done. Areas treated with herbicide will possess wintering bird communities that are characteristic of savanna ecosystems. So that's just saying that once we apply the herbicide, what we expect is to see a shift 
uh, in, in the bird community and how they used habitat uh, before and after the application uh, of the herbicide. This is one of our study plot or study sites, excuse me, the Hugh Sasser Ranch uh, in the Transpecos in Presidio County. Uh, you can see that the green areas is the areas that had woody vegetation that were untreated and then grasslands uh, uh, are in the blue. Uh, within uh, what you initially saw on the bottom uh, of the screen was all the green, then we treated some of that uh, that's now represented in yellow. Uh, then we didn't treat uh, some of the brush area, which is represented within the green. And then you see the blue is really what we were considering open grasslands or very low amounts um, of shrub within those. And then what we did was within each a block, uh, that's where we were actually serving. So we didn't survey every single block. It is those in red uh, that we actually surveyed for birds for comparison of how they were responding to, to the treatments. We had another ranch uh, actual east of Alpine or east of the other site, uh, the McKnight Ranch, uh, but the same, same scenario where we had the blue is the areas that we considered open grasslands. Uh, we had some green that was the untreated shrubland and then the treated shrubland was that in yellow. We had a third property that we were actually monitoring, uh, the Dixon Water Foundation with the MIMS unit in Marfa, Texas, uh, is what we consider to be uh, really one of the most uh, pristine uh, grasslands within West Texas. It is certainly one of the, the best I've seen in the entire Chihuahuan Desert. So we use that not necessarily as a control, but something to compare to uh, as far as an open grassland, if, if that's the best case scenario, how does it compare this best case scenario to areas that we've treated uh, with honey mesquite and other areas? Some results that we have, uh, we've done 628 line transect surveys uh, throughout the last few winters. Uh, over 36,000 individual birds have been detected and over 70 species have been identified uh, within those uh, species. Grassland obligate, we've had uh, 19 species grassland. Uh, we had 17 species of those, non-grassland 36, and then unknown species that weren't uh, able to identify it in the, in the field were 7% uh, of the detections. Uh, this looks, uh, so this is the main results that we have of what we see within uh, the shift and the, the birds or how they're actually using. Uh, the, the grasslands and the treated areas, you see the, the circle in red is the birds within the grassland area. You see that it's very diverse. So the larger they are, the more diversity we see. And then if the circles overlap quite a bit, that means that they're using the same uh, habitat. Uh, what we see then is the treated areas in green. Uh, what that means is that they're very specialized birds are using those areas. We see the untreated to be a different set of birds. Uh, to explain a little bit more of what's going on uh, within those, what we see is that the blue and the green, uh, we see a shift uh, within shrub cover and shrub height uh, throughout time. And that's where we see that those blue uh, and green uh, circles are. And then we see that for the red, uh, the grassland birds are actually more seeking for things such as uh, grass cover and grass height seems to be explaining the vast majority of where those birds actually go. Uh, this is the same uh, results. The only difference is now we broke it up into time. Through, so, so throughout years, we have four years, four winters that we monitor for these birds, uh, but you see similarities within how the bird species are actually using uh, the landscape. You see those grassland birds uh, using a greater uh, amount or diversity of those birds is higher. But then you see the specialization or how uh, the specialist birds uh, are actually using the treated areas a little bit more. So one thing to notice is that, for example, in 2022, uh, the treated area for the bird species that are there, that circle in the bottom right, the green is getting smaller and smaller. So what that's indicating is that those birds uh, are, we're seeing more specialized birds using those areas.
Uh, so for discussion, winter bird communities in the Transpecos are shaped by shrub cover and shrub height. We do see a shift uh, on how these birds respond to at least the presence of, of the birds and the diversity of birds and the quantity of birds seems to be really shifting as we moved the plant community from more, from more of a shrub dominated community to more of an open grassland, which is what we expected that would happen. Uh, crucial to focus on restoration efforts on encroaching, encroaching shrub removal. Uh, so we do need to continue our efforts. We are seeing the response that we expected from the grassland birds, uh, but we need to continue our efforts. One thing that to clarify is that herbicide isn't really the, the one single solution for our problems. There's many solutions. Uh, we just need to figure out which one is the best for each case scenario. And then the other thing that we're noticing is that once we apply the herbicide, the structure still remains. So the skeleton of that shrub still remains there and that might hinder uh, the use of that landscape uh, for pronghorn or maybe even some other uh, specialized birds. So we're trying to come up with more of a, a recipes that we don't have. We know some of the ingredients, for example, herbicide and mechanical treatments. When do we apply herbicide? How, how much later do we remove those skeletons? Does it have to be mechanical? Could it be a, uh, some other tool such as fire? Uh, we're still trying to figure those things out. Another important part is to continue to conduct winter bird surveys in the Transpecos to assess the effects of the restoration efforts. Uh, without monitoring, we are clueless of, of the effects, whether they're positive or negative, or, or just how much effect are we actually causing uh, to, to achieve the goals that we expected to achieve. So again, monitoring uh, is certainly part of the management strategy that we try to implement. Uh, some closing remarks as I got two minutes left. Um, some advantages of herbicide is that it can be used in terrain that is unsuitable for other methods, um, cheaper than most mechanical control methods. We just did, we started another project doing uh, creosote control and it is three times the price. It was $165 an acre uh, to do mechanical control for creosote. Um, so, Chemicals do have that advantage that can be cheaper than mechanical, uh, reduces labor requirement for treatment, herbicide selectivity. Uh, if you're doing individual plant treatments uh, through herbicide, you can uh, manage for individual plants. Uh, grass usually does not get harmed when you're trying to, to use herbicide. Soil is less exposed to erosion. Uh, rapid control methods uh, can be safer than fire. Some disadvantages, uh, cost. So it's cheaper than the most expensive thing, but that doesn't make it cheap. Uh, there's still a uh, very high cost associated, especially in areas like West Texas, where you need hundreds, if not thousands of acres to do uh, some type of benefit for wildlife as, as you're doing restoration. Uh, lack of selectivity. Uh, we are talking about the Forbes shock, for example. If we're trying to just uh, reduce the amount of canopy cover from brush, if forbs are present, you may be uh, harming them as well. Secondary invasions, uh, once we do applications of herbicide, do you really know what's gonna come out of the ground? Uh, what if invasive grasses is the only thing that comes out of the ground? Uh, we have issues in West Texas and some areas with uh, layman's, lack, layman's love grass uh, as an example that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of value for livestock productivity uh, or wildlife. So. Uh, if you're just shifting one problem to another problem. So that's something to think of as you're selecting for, for any method. Effective time to spray may be very short or sometimes species um, and longer for others. One issue that we've had in West Texas is we were talking about some of the, the limitations that people may have is funding. Um, Sometimes we've had issues for the past few years where we were very fortunate to receive large amounts of funding uh, for herbicide application for mesquite, uh, but then it came the drought and the drought and the drought. Uh, luckily, the people uh, funding uh, these projects have, are very considerate uh, and we were not obligated to spray all the mesquite uh, just to spend the money. They've been very considerate and very nice and kind to, to allow us to wait for the proper time to spray just so it's cost effective for everybody instead of wasting time and efforts. Uh, but again, that is one of the issues with herbicide is it has to be the right time. 
Another thing to think about uh, is the amount of improvement that can be achieved depends on the kind of ecosystem. Uh, herbicide is one tool in the toolbox, uh, but how the, the plant community will respond to that one treatment will vary greatly uh, within uh, each ecosystem being different. So you need to be very thoughtful about what you're gonna do and what you anticipate that response to be, not only based on the treatment itself, but the actual conditions of the landscape. So with that, I think that's all we have for you guys. I think we're hopefully right on time. Thank you. Thank you both Dr. Gonzalez and Cody. That was really great. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of detail that you included in that presentation about things that we've been hearing folks be concerned about, specifically the grassland bird responses in those specialist bird communities. Um, and I was really happy to see some questions in the chat um, asking to go a little bit more in detail around that. Um, I'll give folks just a minute uh, if you have any other questions, just to think about what you heard, digest that for a second and, uh, and type it into the chat. So we'll, we'll just take maybe 60 seconds here as a break to, to let folks type their questions, put them in the chat, and then we'll, we'll get to them as they, as they came in. So I'd encourage folks to just sit back, mull what you've, what you've heard for a second and, and see if you have any, uh, any questions that you'd love to pose both to the, to the presenters that we have today, but to the other experts who are in the room as well. All right. Well, I'll um, I'll ask folks. I'll call on people who put questions in the chat just to see if they want to ask the questions themselves. So, uh, Rebecca Rylander, if you're if you're here, I'd invite you to unmute and ask your question. Um, yeah, sure. I just had a question about if y'all performed any sort of vegetation monitoring along with the. Uh, the bird surveys, and if so, what kind of vegetation monitoring did y'all do to see if the treatment had had some sort of before and after effect? Yes, yeah, so we we did. I, I skipped that information uh, due to time uh, constraints in the presentation, but that is the other half of Emily's chapter uh, in her thesis. Uh, she did see uh, some differences, but they didn't seem to be very major. Uh, I attribute that not to be the case uh, in the actual field. I think that once you go to the field, it's fairly evident that there is a big change from where in the fence line, you can see where it was sprayed. Uh, I attribute the results really showing what they do more to the monitoring techniques. Um, I don't think the monitoring techniques that we use were probably the most proper uh, to assess the change in the vegetation. A lot of those uh, techniques, uh, for example, was within a transect, uh, they would stop and then make assessments of, of I think it was 50 meter radius uh, estimation of canopy cover. Uh, so it was more about the, it was more about monitoring the birds themselves and figuring out quick, easy, fast, convenient ways to do vegetation as you're doing your, your bird surveys. So more than me being able confidently to say that results say that there was not a big change in the plant community, I think that was more attributed to our monitoring program not being the most proper for the vegetation itself. Thank you, that was great. Rebecca, does that answer your question? Great, awesome. Um, we have another question in here from Tice of Quail. Tice, if you're here, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, interesting presentation. I was curious about uh, how the scaled quail responded to these treatments. And, and I guess related to that, was your treatment protocol done in such a way to create some sort of a mosaic? I was struck by the running W and the uh, 1853, that would certainly create edge. 
<laughs> so absolutely, quail were monitored during um, this treatment effort. It was done fairly intensely about a year um, post treatment. However, that's whenever um, that grad student's project was over. And so we did see a little bit of an avo avoidance, but like I said, that was probably due to the lack of feed that was in there um, with the response of the forbs from the herbicide. So with the uh, removal of these mesquites and some of these other um, woody species that are not necessarily desirable, there's a lot of water release out there. And so the species that weren't affected by the herbicides, such as four-winged saltbush, um, low bush, uh, a, a variety of cacti, all those are still out on the landscape. And so they, they're creating that mosaic. There's, there's um, out here, there's what we call banded vegetation. So there's a lot of bare ground mixed with um, these bands of vegetation and it creates a lot of edge and a lot of um, areas for forb growth um, and a lot of, you know, insects in, in that. So the quail response over time has seemed to increase. But what we really struggle with is um, rainfall and, and any consistency in our rainfall. So like I said, last year we had about 16 inches. This year we're only up to about three and a half inches. Um, and that has a lot to do with, you know, the areas that these quail are using as well as how big of broods they're bringing up. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Now, I, and also I think it answered someone else's question that some of those other shrubs uh, and the cacti remained, which is good news. Some of these herbicides are broad spectrum and you lose those species. Thanks, Tice. I think you also had a question there uh, about pronghorn forage and, and whether pronghorn were monitored. They yeah, so you, well. you mentioned the loss of some half shrubs and, uh, and forbs. And of course, that's kind of key forage for the pronghorn antelope. And, I was just wondering if you were monitoring those guys. Yeah, so for, through some of our studies and literature, we've, we've known for quite a bit of time now, pronghorn's diet is 80, 85 plus percent forbs. Um, so by using herbicides that we're promoting to use herbicides, that would affect the forbs. So how do we actually justify using herbicides to restore pronghorn habitat if herbicides kill the forbs uh, has been a common question throughout time. Um, the answer is the pronghorn are not using these areas, period, uh, regardless of, of anything. If there's forbs or not in the area, that's not what's making pronghorn go or not go. The fact that there's that much shrub cover is preventing the pronghorn from going. We had some restoration efforts where we collared the animals uh, to actually uh, monitor their movements. And what we realized is that shrub uh, mesquite is one of the, the biggest issues that we have. It acts as a wall. As soon as they get to the mesquite, and, mesquite encroached areas, pronghorn are not walking into to those areas. They'll walk all around the edge, but not walk inside. Uh, what we're trying to do now is to reduce the amount of, of that shrub cover, allow for them the, the growth of grass and forbs, even if it takes a couple years down the road. So it's not a one year and then the results are there. Um, but we're seeing positive feedback. We do see pronghorn areas where we didn't see pronghorn in the past. Uh, so again, that's our justification to use herbicides is we know pronghorn aren't gonna use, are not using those areas at all previously to using the herbicide. And we know that they're using it uh, after we apply, even if it takes a year or two for that to happen. Yeah, thanks for the clarification about a staged strategy. That seems very important. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, the next question that we had comes from David, David Bory, um, about permitting. David, if you're still here, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, this question is because in Mexico, we have been trying to do this in some areas, but I think due to the, the difference between the laws in both countries, here in Mexico, you need a permit from government to make any change in the vegetation. Uh, do you need a permit in the United States to apply herbicide across whatever, especially a private land, maybe in the state's land or federal land you you did, you, you don't, but in private land you need some permit for that? Not that I know of. 
I just had a group of students from Chihuahua stay here the whole week. Uh, so we're talking about the differences in law. Uh, water was a big issue for them. For them, it's really hard to believe that here you just hire a company and dig as many wells as you can afford. Uh, back in Mexico, you, you need permits and they're very hard to obtain, if even possible to obtain, to make a well uh, at this point. Uh, for herbicide, you might need a license uh, for you to apply it, but not necessarily a permit for you, for, or not a permit from the government for you to change that landscape. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I had sort of a, a follow-up question on that. Of uh, you, you mentioned the riparian area that runs through some of these study areas, and I was wondering if the um, yeah during rain, if you if you get rain again, <laughs> if there is if there is uh, any concerns of runoff to, from the herbicides into the riparian areas, if you consider that, or if that comes into what we did notice is that. Um, that Sendero and, and even the Sendero and Remedy mix seemed to be pretty target specific. There were a lot of cottonwoods and willows along the creek there that were definitely uh, subject to overspray. Um, we did have about a 10 mile an hour wind or so, and they weren't so much affected. Um, it, it's always a concern no matter what herbicide you're using, especially like even say spike. Um, whenever you're you're on any kind of slope or something like that. So what really helped us, especially with the spike, is once we started getting a little bit of herbaceous cover, it really slowed down and mitigated any of that potential of uh, contaminating any of the areas that we weren't intentionally uh, trying to treat. Thank you. And, and again, I'm doing another tack on question here. <laughs> I remember you, Cody, you were saying that the soil types are really conducive to using spike. And I was wondering if you could elaborate, what was it about the soil types? Is it the gravel content? Is it the really fine silt? Or what, can, you, can you just elaborate on what people should look for in that soil type if they're making that decision, whether to use Sendero or, or spike or different herbicides? Sure. So, um, you know, spike is a pelleted herbicide and it relies on rain to um, activate it, to melt it down and infiltrate into the soil. So one of the big things is that there is high infiltration in that area. There's a low clay content and clay will actually bind with the active ingredient in spike, making it um, less effective. And so for those reasons in particular, and then also the lack of slope, so we weren't too worried about um, wasting any of that uh, material or any of that that uh, herbicide because we weren't going to get a lot of runoff or any of those kind of things there. Thank you. Um, the next question that we had here was from Price, Price Rumblow. Uh, Price, are you, on, are you on the line? Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah. Hey, Cody. Uh, so the herb, y'all were, were talking about treating honey mesquite, but um, I'm, I'm sure that's Western honey mesquite down there. So I'm just curious what type of discussion went into um, using this Sendero and Remedy on Western honey mesquite. Um, and if y'all changed the timing of application um, and was it, it I, I noticed Cody said that y'all put it out July, August. So was it just y'all were waiting on that monsoon to hit and then, uh, or, I just kind of wanted to look behind the curtain a little bit on that and what y'all's discussion was with uh, Western honey mesquite versus honey. So for us, at least uh, in Marfa, uh, Hugh Sasser Ranch, the reason we apply when we apply is because the company that sells the product tells us not to apply it. So when the people selling you the product tell you it's not going to work, um, that puts us on a red flag of don't do it. Um, they have people that come out and decide when to do it, um, but uh, that's what we use is the advice from the company selling the product or the chemicals when they think they can have a, a greater kill rate so we can actually continue business with them. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that time frame is before uh, bean elongation. So they're completely foliated. They've got those real dark green leaves on them and they're still sending a lot of nutrient to the root bud. And so that's kind of that prime time uh, to go ahead and hit them with that foliar spray um, to, to really to have the best effect on them. Does that get to your question, Price? Great. 
Um, thank you. The next question that we had was from Annie Hawkinson. Annie, are, are you still on the line? Ask your question. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Um, so I work for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and coordinate the winter monitoring program. So we use the same protocol. Um, I was wondering, Lalo and um, Cody, if you guys with Emily had explored something yet, um, whether or not the remaining shrub structure deters grassland birds? Like, is it enough to just kill the shrubs um, and reduce the foliage? Or do you need to physically remove the shrubs since a lot of really critical avian predators like shrikes um, perch in shrubs and um, that might affect those focal grassland species you guys are looking at? Uh, I don't think Emily has looked into that because we don't have an area where we applied herbicide and then took the skeletons of half of that area out to have a comparison. Um, so it would be more of a gut feeling me telling you yes right now, because we don't have any evidence or data looking into that. Uh, I think for pronghorn, we have seen not only in the Transpecos, but in the Edward, Edwards Plateau, uh, there's another property over there doing a lot of brush work where they have seen the need to not just spray the, herb, uh, the, the mesquite, but then knock it down for pronghorn. For grassland birds, my gut tells me, yes, it would be better if we knock it down and we either do mechanical uh, with an aerator, uh, with pulled through a tractor or fire, but I don't have any evidence to suggest that it would make any significant difference uh, to do follow-up treatments specifically for grassland birds or not. In the Elephant Mountain, um, it's definitely something that we have considered and would like to do in the future. One of the constraints that Texas Parks and Wildlife works under is we also manage cultural resources on all the public lands. And so this would require having an archaeologist come out and, and cover the entire area looking for any kind of significant artifact. And then those areas would obviously not be disturbed at all. So any kind of soil disturbance, it's very difficult for us to do. And so our hope is that possibly in the future, we will grow enough of a fuel load that we will be able to send fire through these areas. Um, a lot of that taller, denser uh, skeletal structure is just gonna stay. Um, we're not gonna be able to burn that down, but we will be able to remove a lot of that lower growing um, structure that uh, we, we consider, or we would think um, would definitely deter the uh, grassland birds from being in that area. Great, thanks, and thanks for the presentation. I'm wondering if we have anybody else on the line who can speak to that question as well. Anybody has some experience or data or knows of resources that, that question that Annie asked about whether the shrub skeletons have, a, have an effect on, on the grassland birds? All right, we'll move on to the next question. The next question was from Thomas, Thomas, uh, Thomas Janke. Uh, are you still on the line, Thomas? Would you like to ask your question? Yep, thank you, Mr. Ariel and Lalo and Cody. Thank you all very much. Uh, Cody, I was curious, you mentioned um, at Elephant Mountain, y'all had the different herbicide treatments in 2015. Some were Sendero, some were Sendero plus Remedy, and then y'all followed up those treatments, or it looked like most of those areas in 2020. So um, at least prior to y'all's five-year follow-up, did y'all see any differences in the areas that y'all just did Sendero versus the areas y'all did Sendero plus Remedy on, on brush control or brush kill? So the difference in chemicals, there was actually no statistical difference um, at all. The only difference that we did see is on the individual plant treatments, any structure that was over about five feet tall, um, approaching you know six to seven feet tall, those were a little harder to hit. They were bigger plants, they had bigger canopies, and so the kill on those was definitely reduced by comparison to the lower growth forms. But as far as um, the difference in chemicals, it, there was no difference. And the reason we went back in 2020 with just straight, um, Sendero was because that addition of Remedy was a little bit more expensive, so it, it made more sense to just go back with straight Sendero. I, I guess a follow-up to that, Cody, 
St. Joe were basically, it might have been hitting some new plants. It might have been hitting some re-sprouts. Did y'all did y'all stick with the same uh, amount of um, of Sendero per acre or active ingredient per acre, or did y'all feel that y'all could change that amount on your on your follow up treatment? We were consistent with the amount that we were using. Okay, thank you, Thanks, sir. I think that might bring us to the end of the questions that we got in the chat. Um, I just wanted to give a chance to folks uh, to ask any follow-up questions or anything they didn't get in the chat. Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and jump right on in. We'll open up the floor to anyone who has questions or uh, Lalo and Cody, if y'all have any questions for the, for the folks who are here today, uh, feel, free to, feel free to go ahead. I don't think so. Um, I had a question. I can't get myself to off my image here, but anyway, <laughs> I was uh, this Ty Sapley, and I'm based in Arizona, and you know we're we're on the far western edge of the Chihuahuan grasslands, and I, I wonder you're more central to where a lot of these wintering Great Plains grassland birds come. And I guess my question is trade-off of managing for wintering grassland bird requirements, because some of those birds are perfectly happy with virtually no um, structure as compared to your native breeding birds like the scale quail and others. Um, just your thoughts about that. Um have no worries that we're gonna run out of brush uh, in West Texas. Um, I think we're really more concerned with making room for those that are, for those populations and species that seem to be hurting the most. Uh, some other species out here, for example, scale quail, uh, we don't, their populations have been fluctuating quite a bit up and down, uh, but we have more concerns with those wintering grassland birds uh, at the moment, so that's, kind of where we find the balance is trying to help those that need it the most. Okay, thanks, yeah. Thanks for that question, Tice. Um, Thomas, I see that your hand is raised. Do you want to go ahead? Lalo, I got a, I guess a follow-up question to that for you. And I don't know if y'all's data set looks at this or captures this or not, but for the, y'all had, y'all measured uh, bird, you have monitored birds as well as some brush over time. And um, it looked like the same plots. Do you feel that you could say X amount of time post-treatment, be it one year, two year, whatever the case may be, you start seeing a, a, a change in those bird uh, diversity in the indices or number of different species? And, or does that kind of, have y'all kind of plateaued on that or does every year it keeps on growing? You know, basically over time, how soon should we expect birds to respond to brush treatment, at least with herbicide or mechanical? And, and does that grow over, grow over time with the number of different species that continue to come? What we saw is it's changing every year. When it plateaus for that change, I would say never, because plant community will never stay the same. So even if it plateaus at 15 years from now, by then we're probably gonna see an a start of an increase of mesquite back into where it was, if that makes sense. So it's just gonna be this continuous fluctuation throughout time uh, of just a battle of controlling brush. Um, for now, uh, for those grassland, uh, up for areas and treated areas, we saw a reduction of bird species. What we see is an increase of birds that are specialized for grasslands. So there's fewer species. That's why the circles were getting smaller, the green one, I think it was. Uh, so that means that there's fewer species, but they're very specialized birds using those areas. So that's kind of a trade-off. There's 
fewer species, but they're species that need that a little bit more or more specialized within those. So we have seen that change, um, but we've seen a change every year. And when do we stop seeing a change? I'd imagine never. Uh, we just see that fluctuation through time. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, I see Daniel Bunting, you have your hand raised. Go for it, Daniel. Thanks. Yeah, you made a, a good point early on in the presentation that you kind of had a picture of a nice homogenous grassland and then um, one with encroach um, cactus and mesquite. And um, you kind of made that point, well, maybe we shouldn't really do a treatment unless we kind of know what the stressors are, what's, what's behind it all. But my question is more like, uh, this evolution, we can argue um, whether we knew what it looked like historically, or we had a pretty good idea that it's pretty much 100% grassland. But these days, since you're saying that there's going to be plenty of brush, you're always going to be battling brush and trees and mesquite. Um, is there some limit of acceptability of shrub cover in your area, or does that just depend on different, um, I guess, sub management areas where? You know, you might go for 100% homogenous grassland for specific birds, but it might actually be okay to have a little bit of different plant composition with a little bit of woody structure in other areas. I would say it is goal dependent. It's going to vary from property to property, uh, and it is going to be funding dependent. So even if my goal is to make something look uh, like that open grassland where it's just nothing but blue ground everywhere, can I afford it? would be one question. Uh, and if you can and you shift that plant community, it's going to come with a price that is going to be continued management throughout time. Is there an acceptance level? I think there should be. I think we need to be okay with the idea that shrubs have always been present in the grasslands and they will continue to be present in the grasslands long after we're all gone uh, from this earth. So they're important for something. Just because they're not meeting our goals doesn't mean that that plant isn't important or it doesn't have value for something else. Um, so I think you're right. There should be an acceptance level of those shrubs and those species. Um, what that is, I think it's context, it's, it's goal dependent. I don't have a specific 50% or 25% of the landscape, it's okay. Cause then we can also get into the distribution, the spatial distribution, uh, what plant species are actually co the composition of those uh, actually making up for that plant community. So it's it's not as easy as a just what percentage of the landscape can be tolerable or not. Thanks, I appreciate that. I, I, I know we're at the top of the hour. I just want to make one quick comment about um, permitting. I, I, I think it was David who mentioned about Mexico versus US. And there are tons of permits and requirements with the federal government. I work for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, but it also depends on the land jurisdiction and Texas with so much private lands, a lot of times if it's on private land, it's a different scenario. But if you were working on public lands, state lands, some kind of park, you'd probably need some kind of permitting from Fish and Wildlife if there's a trust species, a threatened and dangerous species, and from the Corps of Engineers if you're applying some herbicide within the U.S. or U.S. drainage network. So there are, I mean, U.S. has tons of... <laughs> Um, permitting and, and certifications and laws and regulations, but on private lands in Texas, it's a little bit easier overall. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for all the great answers to these questions, Lalo and Cody. I really appreciate it. Um, we are at the top of the hour. If y'all have any other questions for the presenters, feel free to send them. Me as an email, and we can we can try to get get some some answers to that, and send it forward to everyone who registered for this webinar, along with the recording of the presentation. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time. I think that we're gonna we're gonna close it at that. We have another upcoming uh, CCAST webinar about uh, recovering Sonoran pronghorn uh, that folks may be interested in on August thirtieth. Um, stay tuned, and we'll send out a. Uh, a reminder for that as we get closer to the date. Um, really the time uh, from Carlos and from Cody and everyone for asking such great questions and for the good engagement during the discussion. So thank you everyone for spending the last hour with us today and, uh, and have a great rest of your afternoon.